As actors, we have a lot of power and we can make someone's day and we can ruin someone's day. It gives you a feeling it's sometimes better than words. I hated Hollywood. I hated having to worry about how I looked. Oh, I was terrified for the first five years. If you don't know it backwards and forwards, you're never gonna have that accident of life. I just trust and dive in the deep end. Jane, we'll begin with a question for you that in the movie Youth, you play an actress. How much of your own experience do you bring to a part like that? Sort of, at least for me, unconsciously, you, you, you tap into the things about you that are present in the character. I knew Betty Davis, I knew Barbara Stanwyck, and, and you know, my character Brenda's a little bit more Stanwyck-y mm -hmm. than some of the others, but I knew all those divas. I came in just at the end of that era into Hollywood. And so that was kind of in my DNA, but I never cleaned toilets in Brooklyn, you know, <laughs> and I didn't spend too much time in the producer's underpants. But, <laughs> um, you know, but I know people who did, you know, so I don't know, it just was, came pretty easy. Do you have to like a character to, to play her, Isabella? You have to understand her no, mm -hmm. and not like her. Mm. Uh, I don't play enjoy a character that I say I would like. Mm -hmm. Um, but you have to understand her to, in order to play her. <laughs> have empathy. Right. Empathy, yeah. yes, we have empathy. But you don't have to like it. Actually, it's fun to sometimes play nasty, a murder, somebody yeah. dark. You don't wish to be in life, but, but it's fun to play it. Being empathetic towards somebody who maybe seems unlikable on the surface, there's often something that has happened to that person. I tend to look for clues like that, um, that it didn't come from nowhere that right. something probably happened to that person that maybe really hurt them at some point and they started, you know, protecting themselves. Jennifer, we know very little about your character in The Hateful Eight, except that she first appears on screen with a black eye and a $10,000 bounty on her head. Mm -hmm. So how do you find your way into a woman like that? Very slowly. Yeah. <laughs> Quentin wanted it to come from the inside out, and so he didn't want me to come with any presumptions and. We had two weeks rehearsal, which is such an enormous luxury. And he really just wanted us to kind of find it together and find it slowly and not go for any kind of results. And so that's what we did. Because mm -hmm. so, he just wants every actor to be kind of alive in the moment, you know? So that's how we approached it. And you were shooting with, you were one woman of seven or eight really tough guys in that cabin, right? Yes. What was that like? I mean, I always, I have thought of myself as a real girl's girl. So to be surrounded by all these macho guys, I, I had no idea what I was getting into. And they never treated me like a princess or like I was any different. And at the same time, I felt so protected and cared for. And it, it was just a, an incredible experience. Also, I got to be a fly on the wall. I mean, you never get to have that experience, you know? Like, really see how men are together and... Because they, I mean, they didn't clean up their language, they didn't clean up their stories for me, nothing. And <laughs> I, I, love, I loved every second of it, really. <laughs> really did. Isabella, in, in Joy, the, the power dynamic between your character and the title character, Joy, played by Jennifer Lawrence, you were sort of financing her business operations. It's unusual in the, in the, the conversations about commerce, about business, to see those conversations in, a, in something happening between two women. Yeah. Did, you, did you find that unusual? The film is about women wanting to be in business. Uh, and Jennifer Lawrence is the lead and uh, is a woman who decides to, to be an entrepreneur, to be a, a businesswoman. She, she has kids, she's a housewife, she takes care of this crazy family, but crazy like every other family. So the film is, wants to be a film about women and strong women. Um, and me too, I, I am a widow who inherited some money 
And me too, in my awkward way, I try to deal with money and finances, and I'm awkward about it. I'm scolding everybody, I say, money is important. You understand, you know, because I'm afraid that women don't understand that point. <laughs> Joan, it's so interesting. Your character in Room appears just about halfway through the movie. A big part of it has developed already, and you're greeting your daughter, played by Brie Larson, as she's coming out of captivity. And I wonder, how did you prepare to play someone in that scenario? It's so specific and so unusual. I think just even though the situation is so extreme uh, of losing a child and not knowing what's happened, um, I think as parents, we know, you know, I've been in a mall when my daughter was little and I turned around and within a flash, she's not there. And that depth of panic um, and, and, and I think that just even those small moments you can extrapolate um, larger things from. And I think um, parents are terrified for their children often um, to varying degrees and for various reasons. Well, now we know that they get out of the room. I didn't know that before. I'm sorry. I think it's a spoiler so alert. <laughs> no, it's his fault. It's mine. But now, Jane, if your character doesn't arrive until somewhat late in the film. You the don't, last fourth, yeah. You don't really have a lot of screen time. Right. And I'm just wondering, what does that sort of limited screen time do for you? Well, I'm 78 years old, <laughs> so if I get a good scene offered to me that is very explosive and combustible, who's going to say no? Actually, it was Al Pacino um, at dinner one night about six months before I sh did the movie who said, listen, there's this scene feels like it was written for you. I had not read a script, so I didn't know what the scene was or anything. It's just, I, I only knew what Al had told me, but I knew it was Paolo Sorrentino. Mm. And I had seen Il Divo, and I had seen the movie that he won the Oscar for, the Grande Bellezza, the Great Beauty. And I, I've never worked with a director like that. You know, kind of Fellini, kind of surreal and so personal, so specific, and I really, wanted to work with him. So I said, well, this will be an adventure, and I'm so grateful he offered it to me. And I didn't really read it until I was on the plane going over. <laughs> Filmed it in a day. And uh, it was fascinating just to watch him work and how he set things up. And Jennifer, Quentin Tarantino obviously is a very specific director, both in his dialogue and in, in his shooting. And so when you're getting involved in a project like that, how do you kind of establish a relationship with him? He just gives you so much to work with. I mean, not only because the writing is so such a pleasure to say and it's so much fun. He just he makes the set just you would there's no place else you'd rather be. And the set was 30 degrees. It was freezing, oh literally, gosh. like because he wanted the breath to be real. But still, everybody wanted to be on set all the time because it was just fun. And he plays music, you know, between, during the lighting setups. There's this great music playing all the time. The director give you music. I love the, it too. I, I love it too. It's sometimes better than words, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It gives you a feeling. One director told me, uh, it gave me wonderful indication, he said about my character, play it like a flamenco. Immediately I knew how to help myself, how to be proud. I, it, music has a, it's a good uh, way to uh, make parallel rather than words. So be proud and you don't know, but play it like a flamenco is more. It's more precise, I think, and if you hear it, too, isn't it? But your director on Joy, David O. Russell, he has a very specific way of shooting. Was it difficult for you to sort of, like, learn his process to no, sync up me, with that? it was completely easy, but I understand that it might be difficult because he talks during the takes. <laughs> but my father, Roberto Rossellini, talked during the takes because in Italy the films are always looped afterwards. So for me, it was... I felt like I was back the way I knew it. So. So that he talks to you while you say, repeat that line, oh, you repeat it. No, tilt your head and repeat it. Oh, tilt your head and repeat it. And then as you do it, ah, you fall into the... So for me, it was really amazing. And the most astounding thing is now um, that when you loop the film, I thought, oh, we have to do everything because there is always David's voice. Nothing. I couldn't believe it. I mean, they must have a master sound man, and also he knows when to speak and when to stop and which I didn't realize because I thought, oh my God, it's a confusion in the sound. 
So, no, I liked it. I liked it the way he directed. How do you know when a director is someone you're going to like working with? People have asked me, what do you look for in a director? I said, unconditional love. Because when you feel secure and you feel like you can make a mistake and you're not going to get yelled at, that you just feel this net underneath you, it makes you braver, it makes you stronger, it makes you more willing to, for me, to to take chances. Well, they're all different, and that's I find the that, difference that is the win. Yes. so interesting. Yeah. And they don't know it. When the director directs you, sometimes they say, oh, you know, his David Lynch did that, or because you know, they haven't worked, uh, but we know all the different styles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's what makes it so interesting. To me, too, it's a great adventure to work but with But it's also directors. why it's so great to work with women, I think. This is your box. This is your container. What do you want it to say? Oh, but I love your career. Don't say that you did it wrong. But it's also why it's so great to work with women, I think. What, what is it for you that's different? We have the same, g g you know, genes. I don't know, we're, we understand each other on a different level. It's, um, I feel safer. I mean, it is kind of shocking because women view stories differently and we're more than half the world. So if you don't have women developing stories and filming them and green lighting them and, and photographing them, you're leaving out the narrative of half the world. And that's not just bad for women, it's bad for men. It's bad for everybody. We all are less as a result of women not being fully represented in the thing that creates consciousness, which is our culture. But now, was there a role when you felt like, now I have a career, like this has sort of clicked in for you? Like it's No, funny. I hated it. I hated Hollywood. I hated having to worry about how I looked. I totally took it for granted. I didn't, when I made On Golden Pond, I will never forget, Catherine Hepburn, who was younger than I am now, came up behind me. I was combing my hair in the mirror, getting ready for a scene. And she came behind me and she went like this. <laughs> this is your box. This is your container. What do you want it to say? She hated the fact that I was not self-conscious. And I used to think that was a pejorative word. But it meant aware of how you present, which I was not at all. And I regret that. And I think about her all the time. You know, why do I have to be so old before I realize two things? The importance of being aware of how you present, and the other is the importance of relationships. How I ever survived, I don't know. But you know, when I was just beginning to make it, I moved to, a, to an attic in France to live with a Frenchman. Oh, but I love your career. Don't say that you did it wrong. You were such an inspiration to all of us because you, 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 right. you were always well, surprising. But I mean, I, it's just, it's kind of surprising, yeah, because I, I never should have survived. And then I got really controversial. I mean, you know, it's just, but in a way, I'm glad I didn't think about it more because then I wouldn't have done the things that were the most exactly. interesting. Exactly. I think it's so hard to, I think it's so hard to, to, to work in for a career, like you have a design of where your career goes and what it should be. I always work at what is interesting to me, you know, and I hopefully <laughs> will make a career. And I guess I'm thinking about these regrets simply because I am more passionate about acting now than I was before. I wish I'd cared that much earlier. Anyway, <laughs> what are your regrets? Ow! <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to remember when I got my SAG card on. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it was compromising positions. I came to film very late. I was long in the tooth, you know, and um, I had done theater in Chicago with Steppenwolf for all in my 20s, and um, I got a play that they took to New York. I really credit them with what, everything that I have been able to achieve. But was that then a difficult transition to make from oh. theater into film? Oh, I was terrified for the first five years. I didn't understand what they were talking about. <laughs> uh, the technical aspect of it, I was like, how do you do a scene when, you know, you're supposed to be crying and all this stuff and people are <laughs> fixing your hair and, you know, and I was, I was like... And you hit your mark. And you hit your and mark. And you find your light. And you yes. find your light. And you have an emotion. And, you, you know, that was like... You know, I was like, I... <laughs> it's funny, I have a similar story where I was doing this TV movie and it was the first time I think I really, I had a close-up and I suddenly saw the camera and it was enormous. 
I just couldn't, I was just mesmerized by how big that thing was. <laughs> and I went home to my mother and she said, how was it? I said, I was terrible. I was, I, I was so intimidated by the camera. And she said, the camera is your friend. You know, you have to just like take it in. Yeah. Don't pretend it doesn't exist, it's there. It's there and it's just part of your world. Jennifer, you're also in an interesting film called Anomalisa. It's a stop motion animated movie. You voice a character. I have to say it was one of the most beautiful love scenes in a movie I've ever seen and it's puppets. It's kind of amazing how you guys got that level of intimacy. Can you talk about what making that movie was like? Well, it was in terms of the love scene, it's funny because I've done a lot of love scenes mm -hmm. on camera, but this is definitely the most intimate, most embarrassing, I mean, most exposing love scene I've ever done, for sh without a doubt. And David and I were, you know, this far away from each other um, in a dark, on a dark sound stage, you know. But it was so, there was just something so intimate about it. And the whole film is like that, you know, it's, it's really kind of heartbreaking. And, yeah. How do you find intimacy with an actor that you're just working with for the first time? I mean, so often you're all put in a position to act like you've known this person, act like you love this person. How do you do that quickly? Well, <laughs> um, depending on who the guy is, you do it all kinds of different ways. But what I sometimes do is look at pictures of him when he was young and gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I hadn't taken things for granted because you can't really take anything for granted. But you don't know that when you're so young. It makes you feel very ash ashamed and frightened. You're damn right I did. That was what it was all about. <laughs>
been intentional about how we've lived and we've managed to get to where we are kind of intact, you sort of know when something is accurate and when it has nothing to do with who you are. Mm -hmm. And I just think you kind of sense it. And so when someone is saying something about you that you feel resonates, and it's not because you're neurotic, I think I've got, kind of gotten over that, and then you pay attention to it and take it in. But a lot of times you can tell when it's just subjective. Is there anything that you have figured out, um, Jennifer, in the last few years in your career that you wish you knew when you were starting out? I did start very young, but I remember the mistakes I made very young. I, I mean, I remember like Robert Blake yelling at me. Oh, well. <laughs> I think the first movie, not the first movie, maybe the second or third movie I did was Fast Times Richmond High, which was a big group of kids, basically, and we made this movie and it was this huge hit. And so I really took it for granted. And um, it isn't really what happens. And, and I turned down the opportunity to work with some really great people and the opportunity to be involved in some really beautiful, wonderful movies. And, and I wish I hadn't taken things for granted because you can't really take anything for granted. But you don't know that when you're so young, you know? Right. Well, thank you, ladies, very much for being here. This was thank lovely. You. Thank you. And thank you for watching The Envelope.